Welcome everybody again. Thank you for taking the time to join us here this evening for another question and answer ses session. Um, a couple of things just to make sure everybody is aware. Uh, we do have registration. Uh, again, I'm not sure why we call it registration since everybody's always registered, but um, next week, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday in the afternoon, we have registration. And so Tuesday, um, August 11th, from 12.30 to 3.30 p.m. is registration for juniors and seniors. On uh, Wednesday the 12th from 12.30 to 3.30 p.m. is registration for 9th and 10th grade. And then on Thursday the 13th from 12.30 to 3.30 p.m. is registration for 7th and 8th graders. And registration is going to be a little bit different this year. We're not having um, an on-campus uh, registration. It'll be a drive-through event very similar to how we collected items at the end of last year. Um, those of you that were with us last year when we collected student items that had been taken home and we gave you items that had been left behind, uh, we're gonna do it in almost exactly the same way. So there'll be several stations that you go through during registration. Um, if you can't come on the assigned afternoon, but you can come on one of the other afternoons, you can certainly do that. So. If you're a seventh or eighth grade family and you can't come on Wednesday, but you can come on Tuesday, please go ahead. You know, we don't want to have you not participate in the event. Um, <clears throat> and if you have multiple children, uh, multiple students with us, just come on the afternoon of the highest grade student. So if you have a junior and a ninth grader, you know, bring both of them to the afternoon of the juniors, which is on Tuesday the 11th and we'll be able to handle everybody each day. Um, and uh, if you're asking uh, how much does it cost when you go through registration, the only thing that we try to collect from everybody is a $5 activity fee. And the $5 activity fee kind of pays for your student planner, so everybody still gets a student planner. And then a couple other things that help us with student activities through the year. It's a nominal fee, it's $5. Um, it'd be great if you if you came with a five dollar bill or a check for five dollars, so we're not exchanging uh, money back and forth. But we will have a money box, and we will be able to make change. But that's pretty much the only fee um, that everybody pays for the juniors and seniors and select sophomores that drive and have cars, and you want to get a parking sticker. That is um, something you can get at registration. So. Um, Officer Kosicki, our new uh, SRO, will be there both uh, the afternoon for the seniors and juniors and the afternoon for the ninth and 10th graders available to um, sell parking stickers. And they are $20 if all you want is the spot. It's $40 if you want the spot and the ability to paint it. And of course, if you choose the $40 option to purchase your spot and paint it, then it is your spot. It is designated to you and only you can park there. Um, but if you do just the $20 parking fee, then it's first come, first serve in the unpainted spots. But anyway, that's for the juniors and seniors, and they kind of know about that, most of them anyway. Um, that's really the only fees. Uh, we will um, be handing out information and everything, but those are the only fees that would be collected at registration. Uh, one other thing to remind everybody, if you haven't already gone to the, uh, web link the website to let us know which learning platform your son or daughter is going to be using this year if you could do that by the end of the day tomorrow we'd appreciate that just kind of helps us figure out you know who's going to be where and that kind of thing and how many kids will be on campus versus e-learning versus combination and that kind of thing and it gives us a heads up if the guidance counselor sees that you've chosen combination then we want to reach out to you to see you know what that selection is going to be um, and then also, if you haven't registered, if you haven't sent in your registration information, um, you can get that link on our website as well. So just a couple um, things that we want to make sure everybody knows what's coming um, down the road. And the last thing before we go to all the questions is for the new families, the families that are new to Cocoa Beach, um, we have mentioned a couple other times we will be having guided tours um, the week of the 17th through the 21st. Um, I'll be sending out another email to everybody tomorrow or the next day, and it's going to have a link for you to sign up if you want a guided tour to sign up for a specific date and time for the tour. 
because we don't want all you know a couple hundred people showing up at the same time so we'll do these individual guided tours and so those are for incoming seventh grade families and any other families that are new to Cocoa Beach because we have plenty of other new families at other grade levels and so we want them to go ahead and get a campus tour and that's going to take place the week of 17th through the 21st there will be some evening hours for those tours on the Tuesday and the Thursday of that week so but there'll be more information in a big email coming out tomorrow or the next day and with that Mr. Ryan we're ready to take some questions Yes, sir. And while I have the, the floor for just a moment, I would I would please urge everyone to make sure that if you have not already done a registration packet, please go online and get the link. Um, you can email it back to us. All the information there is on the website or you can drop it off to us either way. Um, but having that registration packet complete is going to um, make the process go much more smoothly for you on your registration day uh, and, and will uh, keep you from having any delays. OK, uh, so right now we don't have any hands raised. So uh, just in case anybody is um, in the uh, attendee list and has a question. Uh, all right, great. Um, Eileen, if you could go ahead and unmute your camera or your, uh, I'm sorry, your uh, microphone and go ahead and ask your question. All right, it looks like Eileen maybe did not have a question. I apologize, folks. I'm using the name that shows up in the attendees list, so uh, I would normally like to be more formal, but I use what's there. So any questions? Uh, Mary Ann, you just raised your hand if you would like to unmute your mic and go ahead and ask your question. Yes. Hello. Can you hear me? We can. Great. Um, because probably several uh, more students will be using the virtual school than have in the past. Has there been any consideration of adding additional courses like band and ROTC to the program. OK, so all of our courses are available through the e-learning option. So band, ROTC, every course that we offer is available through the e-learning option. Just to review, so everybody has a couple of different options to choose from. You can come to school here in person for every class or you can take the exact same classes at the exact same time through e-learning so that is a virtual format um, but we're calling it e-learning to distinguish that be between that and what's called brevard virtual school or florida virtual school brevard virtual school and florida virtual school have a limited um, course offerings that's different than e-learning um, if you're taking a class through Brevard Virtual or Florida Virtual, you're not taking it through Cocoa Beach. Um, you're taking it through them. And if you're full-time Florida Virtual or full-time Brevard Virtual, you're not a Cocoa Beach junior, senior high student. But as far as when you say taking a class virtually, the e-learning format is the platform. That's when they're taking our classes with our teachers at the exact same time as they're being offered here at school just they're taking them at home through um, electronic medium um, such as Google Classroom, Google Chat, um, Zoom, um, a Teams meeting like this or some other kind of um, format. So band and all those are still part of that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Marianne, I'm going to go ahead and uh, turn off your uh, your hand, lower your hand. And um, Eileen, if you would like to uh, unmute your mic and go ahead and ask your question. Can you hear me now? 
we can hear you. Okay, great. Um, I was wondering, are you still going by the four by four block schedule? And if so, how does that work with lunch and such? Dr. Rendell? Great question. Yeah, so um, the district committed to the four by four block schedule for the year. So we are on this format, both first and second semester. Um, by having 90 minute classes, we actually, that actually allows us to have more than our standard two lunches. So because we have this 90 minute period and then a 30 minute lunch period, it's kind of hard to explain, but basically we have 120 minutes to get a 90 minute block and a 30 minute lunch in, in the same amount of time. So we're gonna have three separate lunches. So there'll be an A lunch. So at the beginning of third block, so to speak, the students who have A lunch, they're gonna go straight to lunch, just like they had A lunch or first lunch in the past. So they go to lunch for 30 minutes and then when the bell rings, they go to class for 90 minutes. There'll be, we will have a second lunch, which is gonna be different where students will go to class at the beginning of third block. They'll go to class for 45 minutes then a bell will ring, they'll go to lunch for 30 minutes, and then a bell ring, and they'll go back to class for 45 minutes. So that's kind of a split period with a lunch in the middle. And then the last group, the group that has C lunch, they'll go to all of third period, all of 90 minutes, and then they'll go to lunch at the end. And so normally we have two lunch periods. Instead, now this will afford us to have three. Um, so we can spread the kids further out, you know, have less of them in the lunch period, so less of them in the cafeteria. Um, so with the blended format that we have with e-learning right now, it's about 45% of our kids or so, and Mr. Ryan can correct me in a minute, uh, have, have indicated the, of the families that have responded to the survey, about 45% have indicated they're coming here in person all day. And then it's a, it's a mix between full-time e-learning and combination. But either way, we're going to have significantly less numbers of students on campus during the day, during lunch. And so by going to three lunch periods, we're going to be able to spread further spread that out. So theoretically, if we have, let's say we have 600 students on campus, then that's probably 200 students per lunch. Um, normally, we have 500 students per lunch, so we're cutting in half or more than half the number of students in lunch. So we'll be able to spread them out. And also we've ordered some additional tables for outside seating, some additional picnic tables. So we're gonna be able to have more outdoor seating during lunch. And um, the cafeteria is gonna run a mobile station out in the courtyard. So lunch is gonna be great because we're gonna be able to spread the kids out more and have three separate and distinct lunches. Um, by having the three lunches the way that we've scheduled it, we'll be able to clean the cafeteria and all the tables in between each of the lunches as well. So I actually think this is going to be the best lunch format we've had in quite a while. Lunch will not be by grade level. However, we'll do it by area of campus. So one area of the campus will have all the classes in that area will have a lunch. And another area of the campus will all have the B lunch. And then another area of the campus will all have C lunch. So that's kind of the skinny on, on lunch. Mr. Ryan, anything to add? No, sir, your uh, percentages are still accurate. Uh, we are at about 45% of the respondents saying they will do um, on campus. Okay, Eileen, did we answer your question? Um, yes, although I do have a follow-up question. Um, because with classes now uh, being 90 minutes long, and typically them being around 35 to 40, um, if a student, let's say, misses three or four days, or heaven forbid, five days of school, they're missing 450 minutes of classroom time, as opposed to what would be less than half of that on a normal week. So what would happen now if a student, let's say, gets sick and they're gone for with a normal cold <laughs> and they're gone for, let's say, two or three days, they're really far behind now. Isn't that a major concern? It is, but keep in mind that um, e-learning is going to be set up for that class. Just about every class is going to have students accessing it through e-learning. So if the student is away, if they're not too too sick, you know, they can actually participate in the class through e-learning. So hopefully they'll be able to just, you know, not so fall so far behind. But sure, anytime you go to a block schedule format, if you miss class, you're typically missing twice as much class each day. Um, but then, you know, we have to work with the students to help help them make it up. But that's one of the beauties of having this blended format is if someone is going to be out 
for a couple of days, they could, you know, probably still log into the class and keep up with their work. Um, we don't want it to be a situation where yeah, today I'm going to stay home. So today I'm going to do your learning. That's not really how it's supposed to work. But if they were going to be out for an extended illness, they could they could probably access the class, the, the schoolwork that way. Great, thank you. Thank you. OK, the next person that uh, has their hand raised, uh, Mr. Foster, David Foster, if you could please unmute your mic and ask your question. Hey, how are y'all doing tonight? Good, how are you? Doing amazing. How's ROTC going to work with all that? Is it going to be an all-year course? Is it going to be a semester still? So it's still going to be offered in the semester format, the 4 by 4 block schedule. All the courses will be in that semester format. Um, you know, um, ROTC is pretty, they're pretty sharp, those guys. They'll figure out, you know, how to, to do the same amount of stuff in the semester than they would over the year. They'll to do some of those practical exercises, um, you know, in the, you know, for the e-learning students. So it's, you know, the Colonel and, and First Sergeant, they're already been, they've been working on it. They've got all kinds of ideas. Um, keep in mind, we're not the first school to ever go to Block. And um, Titusville has ROTC. It's Navy ROTC. And it's not uh, Army. And they've had quite a, a high functioning unit for years and they're on the block. And then um, there's hundreds of schools all around the country that use block and they are, you know, they have ROTC as well. So I'm sure um, Colonel and First Stars has been reaching out to them to see what they do, but it's going to be an offer just like everybody else. And also, would you be allowed to take it for a full year? So twice. Yeah, I'll let Mr. Ryan answer that officially, but my answer is yes, and then I'll let him explain, I guess, how you would do that. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so uh, to go back to the original question, I'll also just add that uh, when we went to the uh, distance learning model at the end of last school year, um, the ROTC organizations uh, around the state got together and their curriculum for online is top notch. Uh, they are uh, already, um, uh, you know, basically in a, in a, in a able to go uh, virtual and be up and running and so they uh, really did a lot of work at the end of last semester to get themselves up and running. So they were uh, they they've talked to me several times about how confident they are that the um, the learning environment for students, regardless of where they're at, is going to be top notch. So that's that's really good. The second thing that I, your second question is, yes, they can. Um, our only drawback or dilemma is finding a course code, depending on where you're at in your years and sequence at school. Um, a senior who's taken four years of ROTC, uh, we might have to find another course code to get you another section um, that second semester. But absolutely, and I'm sure we're going to have people that want to do that. Okay, thank you all so much, and hope you all do good rest of the night. <clears throat> thank you. Okay, Marianne, I see your hand is raised again. If you would like to go ahead and ask your question. Thank you. Can you hear me? We can. Great. Uh, if my memory serves me, on your last meeting, you talked about a sophomore project that students do. Could you repeat that information, um, please? So the sophomore project is just for IB students, um, students in the IB track. We had a, a separate Q&A for the IB families last week, um, but the simple answer is we will still do that project as part of the IB program. If your son or daughter is in the IB program and in the 10th grade, um, we actually have looked at a couple of different ways to incorporate that into some of our 10th grade curriculum. So it's going to be supported just like it would be before. In fact, we might be able to support it even, even better. Mr. Ryan, anything to add? 
Uh, no, yeah, no, sir. I think that uh, I would just tell, I would just make sure everyone understands that we've been working with other schools that do the, the block model and talking to some other schools around the country to get ideas. And, and like Dr. Rendell said, we have um, some options that we might even be able to maximize the, the block schedule to make it a little bit better. So uh, no worries with that. Very good. I didn't realize it was just for IB. Do students have a community project that they have to do, all students or not? No, ma'am, just the IB students as part of their service learning. Very good. Thank you so much. Thank you. Eileen, uh, I see your hand raised. Do you have another question for us? I do. Um, it's with regard to the safety protocols that you guys currently have in place for the students and what would be the procedure if, um, when inevitably, somebody winds up testing positive for the virus? So uh, we notify the district, and to be honest, the district then makes the decision as to how we proceed. And they, they make that decision in consultation with uh, the health department, uh, the Department of Health, or however that, that, that title goes. And so it, it depends on if a student has tested positive you know, that we received the re the word that, you know, they tested positive last week and they haven't been in school because they've been sick or something like that. And we might make different decisions than if, you know, the student is here at school and somehow we learn that they've tested positive or they're sick or something like that. It's really, it's going to depend on, you know, whether the student has, you know, been in contact with a, with a large number of other students that's where they rode the bus to school or whatever. And, um, but to be honest, as far as, our decision making process once we get any kind of notification like that then we would you know notify the district and then they're going to they have a decision tree they're going to go through as to you know how they would make any decisions on whether we would um quarantine you know personnel or or students or shut the school down for a period of time or anything it's all going to be based on what information they receive and one of the things that uh it it can't be just hearsay you know, we're not going to make any decisions based on someone calling up and saying, well, I hear Joe has COVID. You know, that's we have to be notified by um, it was a, a licensed physician, you know, some kind of note from a licensed physician or the Department of Health. Um, so, you know, it's not going to be um, based on hearsay or rumor or anything like that. Now, if we get information like that, we would track it down um, to, to see if it's uh, valid or not. But um, I don't know. If you want to add anything to that, um, no, I was just currently wondering too are masks going to be required now for the students? I personally think it's a good idea. On, um, are you going to be implementing like temperature checks at the door or what kind of procedural um, things do you have in place for preventative measures at this point, like class size, et cetera? So, <clears throat> one of the reasons that uh, this, this, Q&A was originally scheduled for last Thursday evening, um, but the school board was hosting a meeting Thursday evening, um, Thursday afternoon, Thursday evening. And one of the things they were going to discuss was if they were going to make any changes to some of the safety protocols, for example, face masks. So that's one of the reasons we rescheduled this meeting. So we wanted to wait and see if they made any changes. And they did. Um, up until last week, the guidance from the school district, from the school board and the district offices was that um, for students, face masks were at first at one point strongly encouraged. And then um, after that, they went to expected. But then last Thursday, they changed the policy to um, in any instance where social distancing cannot be maintained. So you can't be you can't maintain a distance of six feet or more between you and another person, you must wear a mask. So masks are now, face masks are now required by students and staff on campus unless they're in a position to safely social distance. Um, so if someone does not have a mask, we will be able to provide it for them. Um, we will have thousands of the um, disposable masks, so we'll have the, plenty of those available. And then as far as our faculty, we are actually providing the faculty with um, at, at least 10 cloth face masks that you can be washed and reused, but we'll also have um, disposable um, face masks for them as well. So masks are 
required now on campus anytime you can't, you're in a position where you can't be socially distanced. Obviously, you can take the mask off to eat or drink um, at lunch or anything like that, but but really they're going to be wearing them pretty much most of the day. There will be times where they could you know, be outside in certain activities and um, probably be uh, without a mask. But um, as far as other safety protocols, obviously, um, if a good portion of the student population is accessing our courses through e-learning, then that's going to reduce the number of kids that are physically present here on campus. So that's going to reduce the number of kids who are in class. It's going to reduce the number of kids who are in the hallway. And like we talked about before, it's going to reduce the number of kids in uh, in the cafeteria you know, during lunch. And um, one of the other things that we're going to do is we're going to um, ring a bell one minute before the end of each period to let the seventh and eighth graders begin to move to the next class. So they'll kind of get a head start um, on the rest of the of student population. So we don't have everybody in the hallway at the same time. And then at the end of the day, and this is new information that we hadn't really shared with anybody yet. At the end of the day, we're going to um, dismiss the bus riders, the walkers, and the bike riders five minutes before the rest of the students. So they'll be able to um, start to uh, exit the campus um, of five minutes sooner. So get on the buses, um, the walkers, and the bike riders. And then the rest will be dismissed. The um, car riders and the the drivers. Um, so we're doing some things proactively to try to mitigate um, the number of people all moving around the campus at the same time. Um, last, you mentioned as far as temperature, uh, we have thermometers, the touchless, the gun type thermometer here. Um, it's not mandatory for the student's temperature to be checked unless they're exhibiting any kind of illness symptoms. But teachers do have the op option if they want, we will provide them with a thermometer and they can check every kid coming into their classroom if they want. But it's not um, something we're going to do every morning as the kids come in or anything like that. You know, we have still at least 600 kids coming in. So, you know, that would cause more of a bottleneck if we were to do that, which would then put more people in close proximity, which is what we're not we're trying not to do. Mr. Ryan, did I forget anything? No, sir. Did we answer the question? Um, I think Eileen, did we answer your question? Yes, you did. Um, uh, one other question. I heard talk of other schools requesting that parents sign a liability waiver. Um, at this time, um, to understand correctly that Brevard Schools isn't requiring that, yeah, to my knowledge, uh, I, I haven't heard anything about us requiring a liability waiver for students coming to school. Great. Thank you. You've answered all of my questions. All right. Thank you. Uh, is uh, OK, here we go. Miss Lindhorst, if you would like to unmute your uh, microphone and go ahead and ask your question. Ms. Lindhorst, if you can hear me, if you want to go ahead and unmute your mic and ask your question. All right, Ms. Lindhorst might be having some technical difficulties. Anyone else have any questions while we wait? OK, uh, Fred Stotts, Mr. Stotts, if you would like to go ahead and unmute your mic and ask your question. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. OK, um, I actually have two questions. Um, Dr. Randell said that uh, guidance will reach out to the um, individuals um, if they selected a combination um, on their survey. Um, when do we anticipate guidance um, uh, reaching out to the to those families by they are working their way through the list so um, one of the misconceptions is that um, guidance counselors work during the summer and and, and actually they don't um, we do get some additional hours that we can employ them and so we brought them back on those additional hours but you know we just got the, the, all three of them back this week so they're they have a list and they're starting to work their way down the list Okay. Um, 
And um, sir, my next question is regarding uh, Bright Futures. Um, has there been any change to Bright Futures due to due the, the, the or COVID or anything like that? And um, when do you anticipate any Bright Futures paperwork to be due? I mean, has it been any, so? I haven't heard of any changes to Bright Futures. I'm gonna pitch that to Mr. Ryan if he knows anything about any changes to Bright Futures or, or um, deadlines or anything like that. Uh, yeah, so right now we haven't um, had any recent updates uh, on new procedures for the coming school year. Uh, there were some procedures for the outgoing seniors last year um, who missed the end of the school year, but as of right now, there's been no new guidance on Bright Futures going forward. Thank you very much. No problem. Ms. Lindhorst, I see you're back in line. Um, would you be able to unmute your mic and ask your question? All right. Eileen, do you have your hand raised again, or did I happen I to do. not? No, I okay. do. Um, okay. It was a question actually with regard to Bright Futures as well, because um, I had a student, my daughter last year, she graduated, and unfortunately she wasn't able to take the SAT in 11th grade and was planning on taking it uh, this past March. However, it was postponed and postponed and postponed, um, and she was not able to take the SAT or ACT. Um, she had met all the other qualifications for the full scholarship of Bright Futures, but I was told that the deadline to submit everything was July 31st. I wasn't even aware that the guidance counselors didn't check in throughout the summer, so we tried to reach out um, several times to try and rectify the situation, but it never happened. <laughs> um, so do you have any other advice for students that were seniors last year that are still struggling to um, get the Bright Futures scholarship? Do you want me to take that, Dr. Rindo? Sure. Okay. So, yeah, my my first uh, it, my first in, in, uh, inclination is to ask you to to call Miss um, Carr, the guidance counselor, who who will be in tomorrow. Um, she would be able to look at your individual um, situation and, and help you out with that a little uh, more specifically. There was a an additional date that was added. Uh, it actually was um, just. Uh, Dr. Rindell, help me with the dates. What was the date of that? It was August, or I'm sorry, July 18th. So there was an additional, um, the ACT, not the SAT, but the ACT offered an additional administration that wasn't on the calendar before, and it was July 18th. So it was two weeks ago, but, and it was in an attempt to give it, um, graduating seniors one more chance to up their score on the ACT, whether it was for college or, or Bright Futures or whatever. And, um, you know, we, that has passed, but, um, you know, I miss Carr knows what, if there are any exceptions or extensions or anything like that. Um, she's, she's well versed in, in, in what the latest is with bright futures. Yeah. And I'll add to that, that SAT did not offer an additional, um, testing date only SA or ACT did. So, uh, yeah, please reach out to Mrs. Carr tomorrow and she'll be able to, um, help you if with your individual situation and talk you through that. Great. I hope so. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Right now I have no hands raised. Does anybody have a question <laughs> that they would like to ask? question okay go ahead um i just was wondering if um if there's a e-learning supply list on the website the supply list for e-learners there, there is not a supply list for e-learners um there's typically not too many supply lists once we get up to the middle school and high school level um, individual classrooms will maybe, you know, teachers will put out supply lists after the year starts. Um, something that I need to share with everybody, um, if your son or daughter is going to participate in e-learning, either full-time e-learning or even part-day e-learning, 
um, they really need to make sure they know how to access their focus email account. Every Brevard County public school student has an email account through focus. And that's going to be one of the primary ways or the initial ways that a lot of our teachers you know, connect with their students who are accessing their courses through e-learning. You know, they're all going to set up Google Classrooms or some other you know, medium. They're not going to do everything through email, but some of that initial communication is probably going to go through that focus email. So if your son or daughter, you might want to ask them, hey, do you know you have a focus email? Do you know what it is? Do you know how to log in and check it? Um, because uh, that's how a lot of the e-learning initial uh, communication is going to go out. We also are um, working with the district, you know, because this e-learning is, is not just us doing this, um, with a way to kind of have a launch pad for every um, teacher's classroom that the e-learning students could access. Um, because if you think about it, if I'm, you know, e-learning on the very first day, how do I check in with my teacher? Do I, is there a Google Classroom link? Is there, and so we're putting all that together. And, but again, some of the initial communication for that's probably going to go out through um, the focus email account that each student has. So you might want to check with them to make sure they, they know about that. Um, Mr. Ryan, anything to add? Uh, no, sir. The focus account is going to be the, the main uh, launch pad as far as we know as of right now. So that's all correct. All right. Uh, Eileen, are, are you asking another question or did I forget the hand? No, it, um, I do have another question. Um, no I'm problem. My participation trophy here tonight. Um, Not a problem. It to the uh, e-learning. Is it possible for, like, let's say if um, my son decides that uh, when he's going to school, he doesn't feel comfortable for whatever reason, or it's not working out, and he decides to, um, can he transfer then from the regular brick and mortar to the e-learning if he decided to, or is it possible to do um, a, a part-time e-learning and part-time brick and mortar, or is it one way or the other? So the answer is yes to all of the above. Um, they have the option of full-time in-person, you have the option of full-time e-learning. They have the option of a combination. You know, maybe two classes here in person and two classes through e-learning. Um, you can start out in one format and then you can switch to another format or platform is the term we keep using. Um, we don't really want students switching back and forth from one platform to the other. Say, you know what, I'm gonna be in person this week, but next week I wanna do e-learning. Um, it's gonna be, you know, we want you to start out in one format and then try that for a while. If it's not working, then you can switch to the other format. Our rule of thumb is we're kind of trying to say one switch per quarter, you know, before grading period, um, you know, that kind of thing. So she starts out full um, in person, all four blocks, wants to switch to full time e learning, that's fine. Just got to let us know um, if he wants to switch from you know, two periods here and two periods e learning, you can do that as well. Just a little bit of issue with travel time. If you're going to, you know, do the combination, um, theoretically, you're supposed to be in class e-learning the exact same time that the class is in session. So if you're part, you know, day e-learning, half day in person, there's uh, some travel time involved there that we have to tack. Mr. Ryan, anything? No, sir. Uh, David Foster, I see that you have your hand raised. If you would like to unmute and go ahead and ask your question. Um, I thought I re or heard that the e-learning was going to be streamed through um, like Microsoft Teams. Is that not true? It's going to be like the distance learning last year where they're doing the online format. No, you are correct in that it's supposed to be a live interaction between classroom that's happening here at school and the student interacting with it, you know, at, at, at home or wherever. The idea is that, you know, you set up your little station on the kitchen table and you log into class the same time the class is happening. So it could be being streamed live. It could be a Google chat type format, but either way, the student is supposed to be able to interact and be a part of the class as it is happening. That's different than how we closed out the year last year. 
some of our teachers did do that. Some of our teachers did hold live sessions um, and did do some things, you know, interactive live and then had some Zoom issues. Well, we didn't have any Zoom issues, but there was issues with Zoom and then they kind of cut that off. Um, but we want that to be courses happening. Um, you know, interactive during the same time frame as it is here at school. Um, there will be times there where, the, you know, I'm sure that the teachers will put assignments up and say, you know, you need to work on these just as like home, that kind of thing. And or there'll be time when they issue something to do for the kids to do in while there. And so the same thing the kid at home could be doing it, you know, at home during that same time frame. And it may not be a live activity. Mr. Ryan, anything to add to that? Uh, just that the district is going to be providing teachers with support in uh, the, all the different formats that we have available. We have Google, Google uh, um, Hangouts and, and Teams that we're on now. Uh, they did uh, decide that they, the, the new Zoom um, product has the security features in it that they're um, okay with. So the teachers will have different platforms that they'll be able to choose from to make it more convenient for them. Uh, and so it will be a live simultaneous stream of some sort, uh, but it uh, th th it might not necessarily just be Zoom or Teams. It, it might be whatever the individual teachers are using. Okay, thank you. No problem. I had another question. Sure. Um, if you choose, I, I know you said before, if you choose e-learning, that you have to wait a semester to change if you wanted to go in person or a combination. Um, now you're saying a quarter, which which is it? So a quarter every three months or every, what, when can you change? Okay, so um, you can switch from e-learning back to in-person or from in-person to e-learning at any time. We just need a day or two's notice. The semester, limit was if you were going to go to Brevard Virtual or Florida Virtual. Those are semester commitments. E-learning, oh, okay. you're yeah. in the class, right. E-learning, you're in the class with us here. And so if you're taking it at your kitchen table and you decide, you know what, I'd like to be in class. I'd like to switch to, um, I don't want to ever, um, switch, you know, at any time. We try to limit it to once a quarter. But um, you know, we'll work with students. Okay. Issue, and the other. okay, and and to find out what what platform that teacher is deciding to use, they would go through the focus email to find out if they're using Zoom or Google Teams or one of the other platforms. They just have to be ready to use any one of the three. Correct. Yes. And all those different platforms are all web-based. Um, so really, once you get the login, kind of like this tonight, once you get the login and you, and you jump in, each of them has some some different features and things. But, um, you know, the kids will actually pick this up a lot quicker than us. And our idea is that, this, that the teachers are going to get their um, class rosters um, you know, sometime next week. You know, um, we've got registration, you'll get your schedules and all that. And that there'll start to be some dialogue between the uh, teachers and all of their students through focus or um, a class landing page and things. So hopefully, you know, the goal is that the kids are going to know where to go and what to do before the first day. Um, as, you know, and again, it's kind of while we're, we, we've started to harp on that um focus this email account because that's when the, the initial communications are probably going to go out. Mr. Ryan, anything? Yeah, just to give parents a little bit of uh, uh, maybe uh, ease their minds just a touch, the district is working hard now to package focus with Google Classroom and Zoom, uh, where when you go to your focus page, you'll have links to both of those programs. Um, we don't know what that looks like yet because they're working behind the scenes right now to get all of that done for us uh, because the, the board just um, approved, I guess, some of that last Thursday. But that is really what the picture uh, going forward is going to look like. So our idea is that the students will have one platform and that two teachers will probably end up using that same platform. So we don't really envision 
a scenario where we have a lot of different multiple platforms being used. Um, the district is trying to make it easy on everyone and providing them with what they feel is the most user friendly and so on and so forth. So I'm going to assume that, you know, we're going to see something that's that is more unified, but teachers will have a choice. Um, but uh, I just want to make sure everyone understands that we are trying to make it so that it's it is somewhat easy for everyone to use and get to. And what happens when a, a student has a question if they're e-learning? How does that work? Yes, yeah, so depending on what what um, platform or what program the teacher is using, could be very similar to this. Um, the teacher is going to have the computer screen up, and there could be the hand raising feature. There could be they, you know, the teacher decides to give them the ability to just jump. Verbally and say um, each of those programs have some slightly different features, but the the, the goal is that the student at participate in the class as perfect, but you know, they should have a way with teacher real time, um, ask questions and that kind of stuff. Mr. Ryan, anything? Nope, that's perfect. Okay, go ahead. First of all, I last year I had an email for my old school, but I'm going to this school now. So, will I need to change my email, or will the same one work? Dr. Rendell. Yeah, Mr. Ron, I, I couldn't even hear the question. The volume was so low. If you've got it, you can take it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, OK, so if it's a Brevard Schools uh, email address, then it, it'll be the same email address. That email address follows you. The, your student number follows you. All of that follows you. Um, if you are outside of the district, then you will have a new email address assigned to you, um, you know, once you uh, fill out the, the proper paperwork. There's a cloud-based um, permissions uh, form that has to get signed as part of your registration packet. And then that takes a couple of days before you get set up with your email. But it, it really depends on whether or not you are outside the district or in the district at a, uh, a different school. I was at in I was in Brevard last year, so it'll be the same. Thank you. Yes. Yep. Your sign on for focus, uh, your sign on for um, your launch pad, everything will be exactly the same as it was since you're staying within the district. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Great question. Last time I heard that uh, for the first semester, you'd be taking a set of classes and for the second semester, you'd be taking a set of different classes. Is it possible to take one subject for both semesters? Yes, <laughs> but I'll, I'll let Mr. Ryan, since he's in charge of the curriculum and the master schedule, talk to that. Yeah, so it's going to really kind of depend on the situation. For the most part, the schedule that you're going to see is a seven a seven period schedule with the addition of one period, and then that is broken into half. And so, you know, every student on campus is going to still need a math, a science, a social studies, and an English. So we're not necessarily adding additional courses to the schedule. There aren't extra science classes and extra math classes. So the answer is yes, but it is going to be dependent on whether or not there is room um, for you in those classes because other students that uh, need it as part of their regular progression might already be in that class taking up that seat. So um, yes, but it is a dependent on um, some other you know, variables that your guidance counselor would be able to help you make, um, uh, you know, help you with that dis decision or, or that outcome. Thank you. No problem. A follow-up question. How okay. Can, how can you connect with a guidance counselor? Like, how can you talk to them? So the easiest way to do that would be uh, to call the school if you know your guidance counselor, um, or to email your guidance counselor from our school webpage. So both of those um, are. Uh, the easiest ways right now they're uh, you know obviously taking 
um, appointments for people to come in, but that's not um, really happening as much. Most of what's happening is virtual, either through phone calls or emails, but they are taking appointments by phone call. Uh, but yeah, you can reach out to them by phone or through email from the website. Thank you. No problem. Scrolling back up to the top here, um, Eileen, another question? Um, yes, I was wondering if um, sports and after school activities will be resuming and also, because um, my son is in band, if that course will also be um, offered this year and whether or not they're going to be having uh, performances or things like that. So we'll give you the answers we, that, that we know as of today. These are the answers we know as of today. Um, we don't know for sure about sports and other after school activities. We are preparing to have all the sports and all the after school activities. Um, the Florida High School Activities Association, so that's kind of a state association, primarily deals with sports. Um, they're meeting again in, I think, next week to talk about, you know, whether they're going to delay any sports seasons or anything like that. All they had done so far was delay the start of fall practices. They hadn't really made any other changes. As far as band, um, we will not have marching band. The uh, district has a kind of a coalition of all the band directors, the Brevard County um, High School and Middle School um, band teachers. And they met a few weeks ago and decided that there wouldn't be marching band. Um, there's still gonna be band class, and it's going to focus more on concert and, you know, um, all state individual performances and things like that. If we do have football games and we are allowed to have fans in the stands, then um, Ms. Campbell has said that the band will perform as a pep band in the stands. So, you know, with, if, you know, the best case scenario right now is that we have all of our fall sports, we have fans in the stands and the band is there to perform. But as far as having band class, yes, we will have band class all year, well, you know, semesters, and they will be performing, there will be winter concert, there will, all those things will happen. Okay, great. Um, but if a student was doing e-learning, would they still be able to participate? Yes, absolutely. Um, again, this coalition of band directors got together and they, they came up with some ideas improving upon kind of how we finished last year when we went to remote learning. Um, there are some programs that they're gonna be making available to the students who are doing e-learning. There's a, a program called Smart Music where you can actually you know, listen to recordings and then you can record yourself performing the instrument, you know, the, the music and that kind of thing and then upload that. And so um, again, you know, the idea is they're gonna access the course during the same time period as the course is happening here at school. So Ms. Campbell, um, Ms. Seeley, the, you know, all the teachers will be still um, you know, interacting with them, you know, and they'll, they'll have to practice and, you know, um, download some tapes of them practicing to um, smart music. When I say tapes, it's all digital. It's, it's on, you know, the kids know how to do it. And uh, but they, they will still participate in all the classes, including band. Great. Thank you. And Dr. Rendell, I guess it would also probably be uh, a, a good idea to mention that a student could do uh, e-learning for, uh, you know, periods during the day and possibly even come to come to campus if they wanted to try to take their band class on campus in person. And if it fit into their schedule uh, in, in terms of having time for travel time, that's acceptable too. That's part of that blended model uh, that um, you know, we have as a, as, as an option for, for folks. So that's, that's also an option. Yeah. And so that's, you know, the question earlier from Mr. Foster about ROTC, you know, that's, you know, if there's a class that you feel like, you know, you really need to be in school to participate in, I'm in for that class and you could do the others, you know, either through e-learning or another virtual format, you know, as long as we can do, deal with the travel time, it's totally fine to do it that way. Great. 
Okay, uh, no hands at this time, and I also see nothing in the chat box. So if anybody has any hands to raise or questions to ask, go ahead and uh, free, you're free to do that. Uh, hi, I have a question. Okay. All right, my name's Aubrey Forsyth, and I'm a rising 10th grader this year, and I have two questions. So first of all, um, so for e-learners in particular, um, what would happen if, like Wi-Fi cuts out or you lose power and you're in the middle of a class or just technical difficulties, like would that be an excused absence if you get kicked out of a class or something like that? Yeah, more than likely any kind of uh, technical difficulty that we run into is going to be handled as some kind of ex excused absence or excused assignment or you'll get um, extension to finish it or something like that. Okay, thank you. And then one more question. Uh, for service hours, so community hours, um, is there going to be a specific requirement this year? Because I know that last semester, the hour, or in the spring semester last year, the hours were waived um, because there were less opportunities for some students and it was just different. Will there be a specific requirement um, this semester or second semester? Yeah, I'll let Mr. Ryan tackle that first. Um. Yeah, so that's a, been a, a question that a lot of the other assistant principals um, around the county have been, uh, you know, looking at trying to solve. There are now more options available to students for uh, virtual service hours. Uh, the, uh, in, you know, it's, it is actually a possibility. It's a thing. Um, and so once we get up and running, we'll have more information that we can share with you through um, our guidance department about those. As of this moment, there has not been any conversation about a reduction or removing or waiving the service hour component. Um, but that's just as of this moment, like Dr. Rendell said um, earlier. But to also, you know, just to go back, there are some virtual options in case going somewhere and doing something isn't an option. Dr. Rendell? Yeah, so there hasn't been any changes to the requirements that we're aware of. Um, one of the things we shared at one of the other one of the other virtual Q and A's is there's an app that you can download and you can service opportunities, volunteer opportunities in our community, and several of them are virtual or things you can do with you know, having to go to the facility. And the app is Just Serve, so J-U-S-T-S-E-R-V-E. -E. Um, if you don't have that app, you might want to look it up, uh, look at, you know, get it and put it on, download it on your phone. Just serve. And so if you're looking for um, service learning opportunities or volunteer hours, you can jump on there you type in, you know, your 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 zip code or whatever, and it, and it tells you what's available in your area, and you can sort it by what types of opportunities you want to do. Okay, great. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Good question. Okay, no hands raised right now. Does anyone have a question? I have a question, but I don't have a uh, raise your hand button. Okay, go right ahead. Um, my question is, have you found, um, asked the question, are there going to be exemptions for any students regarding the mask mandate? And I haven't been able to get an answer to the question, what the science behind the decision to now require it for all. Um, if you could just speak to that, I would appreciate it. Sure. So the only guidance that we received from the district so far is that if there is a medical exemption, so we need some kind of signed note from a physician that um, excusing the student from from wearing the mask, you know, that it was detrimental to their health or something like that. Um, that's the only exception that we've been made aware of so far. I believe the final language for the policy is up for a board vote tomorrow. Um, or later this week, Thursday. So, you know, other than that, that's the, all the, the guidance we've received so far. Okay, thank you. Yes, ma'am. Okay, uh, Judith Robert, I think I have your hand raised there at the top. If you'd like to unmute your mic and go ahead and ask your question. 
Yes, hi. Thank you so much. No problem. Uh, thank you for doing this. I just have a few questions. Um, regarding the textbooks for e-learners, will you be providing hard copies for them? Will you organize a drive-through or will you be uploading a soft copy of the textbooks on your website? If you could shed some light on it. That's a great question. And we've actually talked about this a couple of different times. In fact, today we were talking about it again. So any course in which we issue a paper textbook we will still be able to make a paper textbook available to the e-learning students. Um, we talked about whether we wanted to try and get these out to them before school actually starts, or whether we wanted to wait for a couple days before you know get classes settled in to make sure we don't have to make any changes. And to be honest, typically we don't issue textbooks until a week or so after school starts because there's lots of schedule changes. Um, having said that, most of our textbooks have an online component um, in fact, the district's been moving away from purchasing paper textbooks and almost every textbook or, or um, instructional material we have has an online component. Um, the only difference would be there are some consumables. For example, Algebra One has a workbook that the students use, and so that is paper. So anything that we would give you normally in class, hard copy paper, we will make available to the students in e-learning. and. Uh, a, a drive through is exactly what we talked about doing. Um, probably the first couple of days or even before school starts, we wait till we settle in and then we would set that up. Mr. Ryan, anything to add? No, just that uh, every every textbook that the district is looking to adopt from here on out has to is required to have a digital component. And so most of our textbooks do have digital components. And so uh, part of the process and and making sure that your launch pad and that your focus is all accurate and up to date and you know how to log on to it is making sure that you have access to those digital copies. That's how we get those to the students is through their launch pad, through their focus, et cetera. So making sure that your student can log on and has all their credentials now is important so that there isn't a, a large lag in accessing those once the school year starts. But um, it, like Dr. Rendell said, if we don't have it electronically, we you know, have the textbooks we're expecting, you know, just like if we were all going to be in class. So we have them and, and we are looking at ways to get them out to you. So make sure that your launch pad and your focus are up to date and your student knows how to log on. That's the most important thing right now. OK, great. Thank you. I just have one more question uh, regarding the NHS. Um, like, will you be having that online as well? Because usually the meetings are conducted during the lunch hours. So how does that work? the NHS club events, will it be similar like last year for the e-learners or will they be missing out on it? Yeah, so everything that we do here, we want to be able to, the students, the e-learners to access. So whenever we have um, club meetings or celebrations and things like that, we're gonna try to figure out a way for an e-learner to access. So, um, Mr. Carpenter and student government, they've already figured out, you know, ways for them to hold virtual meetings and things like that. So, um, you know, the idea is that uh, we want everybody who's participating through e-learning to still be able to access everything they would as if they were a kid here. We're not gonna be able to accomplish that with everything. One of the things we've been saying from the beginning is there will be times when we have lab, you know, science labs and some things like that where even an e-learner might have to come in to do those things. Um, and if we do get to that situation, we will you know, make those opportunities available either after school or during a, a teacher's planning block or even on a Saturday so that you know, the students don't have to necessarily interact with other students um, you know, in, in small groups or large groups or anything. Um, but uh, all the clubs and activities, you know, all the activities that we have here on campus, we're going to need to try to make sure uh, students through e-learning can access those. Mr. Ryan, anything to add? No, sir. Okay, great. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Good questions. Okay, we have a hand raised. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Balcaron, 
If you'd like to go ahead and unmute your mic and go ahead and ask your question. Uh, yes, sir. good evening. Um, quick good evening. question. Uh, my son's a dual enrollment at Eastern Florida and they're beginning classes on the 17th of August. Uh, and normally they would receive a voucher or the books to start the instruction there at Eastern Florida. With the delayed opening at the high school, I wasn't sure if you had information on how they would receive the books um, with that one, one week gap. Yeah, I'll go ahead and answer that and, and uh, attack that. We actually just got information today uh, from our, uh, our person on campus that handles the textbook distribution. Uh, so um, if you would go ahead and email your guidance counselor tomorrow, we just received information today. Uh, they just received their information today on, on the process. Now, a lot of those are done through the uh, Eastern Florida website. So um, it might not necessarily require a voucher the same way it's been in the past. But like I said, the, the counselors just got that information today. So they would be able to give you the guidance um, on that if you wanted to give them a call tomorrow. Okay, thank you. And uh, a special thanks to everyone on staff. Wonderful job communicating um, these changes. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dr. Rendell, I, did you have anything that you wanted to add to that comment or uh, to my answer? Yeah, no, it just that um, the district has a liaison with Eastern Florida State College and they, they identified the textbook issue weeks ago. And so they've been working on that solution and finally got it ironed out in the communication to us today. So the dual enrollment students will have access to their textbooks before they begin class. All right. Eileen, you have your hand raised if you want to go ahead with your question. Uh, yeah, just a quick question um, with regards to um, notification uh, protocol. If someone in, let's say, my son's class or, heaven forbid, the teacher tests positive for the virus, um, will we be notified and how long will something like that take? And, and um, if so, are you concerned about the delay between taking the actual test and then the usual five days it could take or seven to ten days it could take for the results of that test and who could be exposed in the meantime? Yeah, so again, the, all that guidance is going to come from the district office in consultation with the health department. Um, the thing that I can pledge to you is that as soon as we have information that needs to be shared, we'll share it and we'll use whatever um, tools that we have available to us. The automatic phone call, the automatic email system, um, website information, all that kind of thing. So um, I, I can't really tell you exactly how it's going to unfold if something happens like that. I just know that, you know, once we get any kind of direction from the from the district and, you know, how they want us to react, then, you know, we'll share information as soon as we can. We do have to be careful on sensitive information about students and staff, but uh, we can definitely share information if something is happening, you know, uh, that something's happening and, and how we're going to react. Uh, but uh, it, we don't really have a, a set like you know, how I'm going to handle this situation today because it's it's all going to be different. It's all going to be situation dependent. Mr. Ryan, anything to add? I would just take this opportunity to remind the the 50 some odd um, callers that we have tonight that getting accurate contact information from our families is extremely extremely important. Um, you know. Over time, people like to give email addresses, have no issues with email addresses, some more than others, phone numbers, you know, change. In this environment, having good contact information with our parents and our students is so extremely important. And so during our registration process, we're going to be giving everyone an opportunity to give us the most up-to-date email addresses and phone numbers so that we can make sure that it is in our system. We know we've asked that information before, but if there's, you know, we all we still find people that, you know, are making comments that they haven't heard about this or didn't get the email. And we want to try to eliminate that the best we can. So please, 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 we will not, you know, send you stuff that is uh, frivolous and, and annoying at two o'clock in the morning. It's it's for the benefit of communication and getting out what we need to get out to you guys in a timely fashion. So please, 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 um, you know, consider that when we're when we're asking for contact information. That's all. <laughs> oh, 
Okay, uh, any questions? Anybody have any questions? Go ahead and speak up or raise your hand. I have a question. Go right ahead. Um, I'm finally getting the, uh, the uh, mute thing to work. Um, how does the part-time uh, e-learning and part-time in-person um, gonna look? Um, uh, the part of part-time does it mean to the school? Is it half or two classes? Or, I mean, one class or um, how will that be and who determines that and, and, and all? <laughs> My main question, thank you. Good question. Yeah, so basically you can have any any combination. You could have one in person and three e learn two two the um the only trick is the travel time. If uh you're gonna do the split, some kind of split, some kind of combination, theoretically, um when you're on campus and then you know, if you start your day here on campus and then you're gonna do e learning for your block two, three, or four. You're basically, once you leave the class here in person, you have to be able to let the beginning of the, your first e-learning class. Um, working with the guidance counselor, looking at the schedule, there may be opportunities to schedule the lunch break in between the switch between platforms, or um, you can take one class through like Brevard Virtual or Florida Virtual as your travel time class because access to times of the day. Um, how it's all determined is really a conversation with the guidance counselor and um, the parent and student. Um, and, and Mr. Ryan can you know jump in there if the guidance counselor is not available. So, so Ryan, anything to add? Just that it is still uh, schedule dependent. And so I just want to make sure everyone um, you know, knows and understands that uh, we will do our best to accommodate and work to make the schedules flexible and, 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 and do what it is that you know, people, uh, parents and, and students want to have their schedule do, but it is still dependent on a very fixed um, uh, schedule. And so you know, once that is set, I might not have a class up to a particular period that you know you want to have it and so in that respect I wouldn't be able to give it to you. Um, if I do have it and there's a seat available then by all means we can you know make that work and accommodate. Uh, so I just want to make sure everyone is aware that you know it, it is not a, for a lack of trying or interest in, in being accommodating. The schedule really does drive things for us and so it, you know the questions are dependent on your particular students needs and how they fit into that schedule. So um, like I like Dr. Rendell said, the guidance counselors and myself are all here to help you and and try to maximize that for you the best we possibly can. Yes, that's that's most of my question. Uh, and another addition to that add on is um, once we determine that we're going to be e learning students, for instance, then they will not be able to be in person according to uh, max load for the class. Is that possible or is that not going to be an issue? So Dr. <laughs> Rendell, I can jump in on that. Yeah, go ahead. OK, so uh, yeah, so the schedule is for an in-person or an e-learner the exact same. So I'm going to build, you know, the schedule is built at this point. The schedule is built and students get filtered into those classes. Class size is still uh, something that we're, you know, ha that we have to follow. It's still part of the mandate. That's something that we have to follow. So if there are 27 students in that class, 14 of them could possibly be e-learning and 13 of them could possibly be in the classroom live. Uh, that's the beauty of the e-learning and the beauty of, of staying connected to us in that way that you would be able to come back into that class because your seat, whether it's virtual or in person, is still there. It's not, it doesn't go anywhere. <clears throat> we haven't given it away. Um, it's not someone else's seat, it is your seat. So um, yeah, whether you're in class or virtual, the seat counts are, um, it's included in this total seat count. Thank you very much, we appreciate you all. Yeah, so a different way to say it, just for everybody to understand is, if you're e-learning in second block, 
language arts, English class, and you decide, you know what, I want to go in person, you're in the class. You're already in the class. You're just going to come in and be an in-person student. You're still in the second block. Your seat is already there because you are already in the class. All right. Any other questions? You said that lunch could be used for travel time. Um, the lunch um, time length, is that still going to be then 40 minutes or how long is the lunch period? Right. So it's 30 minutes plus five minutes of transition time. So it's 35 minutes. Thank you. All right. Anyone have a question they'd like to ask or raise their hand? Go right ahead. Hi. Hi there. Um, Go ahead. Well, I see you guys have done a very good um, job at sending me an email. I have a lot of email from the school. Um, I have resumed my kids will attend school with masks or whatever is required. Um, they really want to go to school. So basically, what what they, what of all of those emails I need to answer? Registration, survey of if they go to school, if they do e-learning, what else? Is there any other documentation that is key that I need to fill up? So the one thing that we would really like is a response to the survey that says whether you're going to be in person, uh, e-learning or a combination that helps okay. us keep track of seat counts and all that kind of thing. And then just come to registration next week at the assigned time. If they're coming in person, that's pretty much the only two things you need to do. I have all the documentation for registration in electronic format and I have digital signatures for all of them. Can I just email it? Yes. To front desk? Yep. Cocoa Beach High at BrevardSchools.com. Okay, perfect. Thank you. That's all. All right. Thank you very much. Ms. Lindhorst, do you have another question? Yes, I have one last one. Um, when should the no children problem. start? <laughs> when should the children start checking their focus for the classes and information about their 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 teachers and all? Starting next week. I would week? say probably Tuesday of next week. Probably starting Tuesday or so of next week. Um, I don't think they're going to get anything from a teacher before then because the teachers don't have the rosters yet. All right. Thank you very much. Yeah, Dr. Rendell, I'll just add to that real quick. The, the two systems aren't necessarily connected. So the system that I will give your schedule, uh, that I will use to give you your schedule next week is not necessarily uh, connected to focus until the district flips the switch, so to speak. So, um, you know, it might also be something where we send out an email to everyone, letting them know that they can go on and check to make sure that they're um, their focus that they can log on to their focus and that they can see their courses because at this moment in time we don't have guidance from the district on when they're going to flip that switch and have the two systems talk to each other so it, it you know I would say starting next week is a, like Dr. Rendell said is a great um, uh, timeline but I, I also assume that once we know we would probably send out an email just to let everyone know that uh, they are up and running so uh, I just add that little bit Dr. Rendell. Okay, any other questions? Anyone have anything they would like to ask? I have a question. Sure, go right ahead. How much time is in between each class? Not including one. So five minutes is the is the passing time between each class period. Um, like I said, early, early, early on in the call, we're actually going to ring a bell a minute before the end of each block to have the seventh and eighth graders start making their way to classes. But I wouldn't count that as six minutes. It's just five minutes is the time between classes. Okay. Thank you. No now, problem. I want to go ahead and, and share with everybody, because I don't think we've covered this tonight at all, 
I think we might have mentioned it at one of the class at one of the um, Q and A's earlier. Um, PE physical education is one class that's going to be a little different as far as the student won't necessarily log in and participate with the class the entire 90 minutes um, every day because the PE teacher might take the class out to the track or the softball field or the gym to exercise and, and do athletic activities. And then they can't necessarily take their computer with them. So the students who are e-learning will not necessarily go with the class. So it might be a case where they um, log in at the beginning of the period. Um, the teacher says, this is what we're going to do today. We're all going um, and give the e-learning kid an alternative assignment, you know, that maybe they videotape themselves exercising or something. So there will be... The, um, a slight difference for PE, uh, but other than else, and so if we situation where we're looking for a place for there to be travel, um, that is a possibility as a PE class because there be some, time. but um, that's still going to be a situ individual situation dependent, you know, on the schedule and, and what's going to work. All right. Thank you for that. Uh, Marianne, I see you have your hand raised. If you would like to unmute your mic and ask the question. Thank you. Is no the faculty of the Brevard Virtual School part of the Cocoa Beach High School? The answer is no. Um, Brevard Virtual School is a Brevard school, um, but they have their own staff. And so we take class through Brevard Virtual. It will count. Um, with us, as if you're if you're part part time with them, if you're a full time Brevard virtual student, then you actually disenroll from Cocoa Beach. Thank you. All right, uh, Mr. Stotts, if you would like to go ahead and ask your question. Hi, it's actually his wife, Lisa. Oh, I'm sorry. I, we tag team for a minute. Sorry. That's okay. Um, I don't know because we tag teamed. I'm not sure this was answered before, but who's choosing what classes the children, the students are going to take? Like, so they have four classes. Is who's making that decision of which classes they're going to take? Or in our daughter's case, she's a combination with Eastern Florida. Who's choosing what she's taking at the high school? Is it guidance or how is that being made? Sure, Dr. So the Adele, initial like answer is the, the yeah the initial answer is the schedule was built on their course request from last year. You know these are the courses that they selected last year. If they're a combination student, um, if they've already chosen which courses they're going to take through dual enrollment, uh, you know or broad virtual, then it's going to be the classes remaining on their schedule with us. Um, Mr. Ryan, if you want to explain how that process would work. Yeah, sure. So at the end of last, uh, really, truly, the last January, we went into all of the students' classes and asked them to give us their schedule requests for the following school year. We were able to get that done uh, before we left for distance learning uh, in March. So I have a, a schedule request for each student and alternatives. So uh, uh, several alternatives that the student would want in case one of their primaries wasn't able to be filled. So a dual enrollment student, for example, would have the number of classes that they expected to take at Eastern Florida uh, marked as dual enrollment. And then we would have um, an, an, the, the, the opposite set of uh, classes. We would have al alternatives for those. So maybe they wanted to still take math and science on our campus, but they had two other or three other classes that they were taking at Eastern Florida. I would have those requests and they would be in the schedule um, to get that eighth class. Uh, because we're going to be on a four by four block, we basically pulled that that next um, elective choice. So in most in instances, it's that next elective choice that students ask for. So how are you choosing which semester or is that random, like which semester they're taking what? So we built the schedule uh, and it was essentially completed before we made the change to go to a four by four block. So we had our seven period day completed. And so at that point, obviously there is no need to guess which or, or pick which semester a class falls in because they're all year long. 
Uh, all we did was add that eighth class to that schedule. So in, in essence, create an eight period day and then split that schedule in half. So the first four on their schedule went into first semester and the second four went into uh, second semester. Um, there really is, it, 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 it then becomes very difficult to pick and choose which classes go where. Um, you're basically making decisions on maybe what is more important or what has a priority. So the, the most equitable way to do that is to, you know, basically take that eight period day and break it in half. Some of the decisions that we did go through and do we did make sure that there were uh, a class, uh, if there was one or two of a particular class that there was one in each semester offered. So a student could have the possibility of taking that class either semester if they needed, um, so on and so forth. Um, you know, so I, 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 there's a lot of detail to it that I, you know, I, I don't really wanna, you know, spend the time explaining because I don't wanna waste everyone's time, but I'd be more than happy to answer any other questions if you had anything specifically, but that's basically how we made that eight period schedule and chose the okay. semesters that the classes fall into. Okay, so if their first two classes or whatever class A and class B, they're likely in the first semester, whatever their schedule was before. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Not having seen those schedules, we'll have to wait and find out. <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, we, um, we, we had everything set and ready to go for the other schedules. So uh, in, one, in one sense, it was um, not as terrible of a transition as it, you know, might could have been. Um, but then coming back and trying to make sure that everyone had an eighth period, making sure that they were, you know, not just willy nilly picked. Uh, it, it has taken us a little bit of time and the counselors are at this moment going back through all of the schedules and just making sure all the students have the classes that they need to remain on track, that they are, um, you know, that they have their mesh classes, that they have their math, English, science, and history. Um, oh, one other thing, the computer itself, when we build the program and we build the skeleton for the program, we're able to ask it and tell it that we don't want um, two academic courses in the same semester. So that is another thing that we're going back through to make sure that uh, to the best of our ability, you won't have more than two of your core classes in either semester. So, you know, you, you probably wouldn't see a math, English and science in one semester and then a history in another. You would have two in either semester. So the computer is, is savvy enough to, to program that into it. And then it picks what's best to fit most students. Uh, so the, that's how the computer does that. Thank you. Thank no you. No problem. For your Uh, Ms. Lindhorst, you're next in line if you'd like to ask your question. Yes, um, I would like to ask, uh, which I forgot to make note, uh, which class will be divided by lunch? Is it the third class that we're planning on dividing by lunch? Because there are two, class, uh, two classes each half the day and a lunch period somewhere in the middle. That was discussed earlier, I think. So third block is the class that um, have all the lunch periods associated with it and so there'll be one section of the campus if your classes are in that section of the campus that's going to be the b lunch um a lunch would be a different section of campus and then c lunch would be a different section of campus but um it's all tied to third block so whatever the student is taking in third block and then where that class is located on campus great thank you very much that answers my question Okay, the next person in line is T. Gorton. If you would like to unmute your mic and ask your question, T. Gorton. Uh, yes, I am just wondering if you, if the students participate in full-time e-learning, I don't know if this is the answer earlier, can they still participate in sports? Absolutely, they can participate in everything. The idea is they're okay. still our student, they're just choosing to access the course at home. Um, we just need to make sure that we give them the ability to participate obviously with sports if we're having sports it'll be very easy they show up for practice and all those types of things when we have other activities we're going to have to be mindful of how we schedule those so that they can participate okay and then just a second part to that question is um what how how do you handle absences with e-learning like um, my son has a scoliosis appointment the first week of school now um so how do we handle absences for our e-learning it's a great question. It's a great question. Um, one of the things, so the flip side of that is how do we know the students are attending? So, you know, they will have to engage in the class, you know, each each day 
to be recorded as attending. Um, as far as an absence is concerned, I believe the best way for us to do, for you to handle that is to contact the front office and say, you know, we've got an appointment on this. And then he should be able to email his teacher, you know, and um, we can coordinate that with whatever has been given to the front office as far as you calling and saying, yes, he's got a doctor's appointment on this date from this time, so he's going to miss these classes. And we'll be able to coordinate that in the system to make sure they're shown as excused and his teachers should be able to, you know, accommodate him. Okay. Fantastic. And if they decide at any time that e-learning is not working for them, we have the option to come back to in-person. Yeah. That's the thing I want everybody to understand. We've, we've had several questions like this throughout the day because it is different. We've never done this this way before. If you're an e-learning student, you're in the class. You, you have a seat in the class, you're in the class. So if at any time you say, you know what, I'd like to be physically present in the class, just tell us that you're going to be coming in kind of like a day or two's notice. So the teacher knows it's not like all of a sudden Tommy shows he's in front of him. I didn't know Tommy was coming today or that kind of thing. But you know, you can switch from one platform to the other as long as you. Uh, Perfect. Thank you so much. Okay, the next person with their hand raised, Jeanette, if you'd like to go ahead and unmute your uh, mic and go ahead and ask your question. Um, yeah, I was wondering, because um, last year there was a thing in place where I couldn't have like a gap in the middle of my day, like where, like a gap where I didn't have a class and I had a class before and after it. And I was wondering if there was anything like that this year. And also if I could have like a class, like just say like in the middle of the day, like let's say second block and I don't have first or third block, can I just come and leave as I need to or? So you still need to have a full schedule. Now maybe the accessing Florida virtual, virtual or dual enrollment, I guess is what you're saying. So Mr. Ryan, if you want to chime in. Yeah, so the, the state requirement is still going to be that you have to be scheduled for, um, you know, the same number of periods that we, you know, require, so eight periods. So there really isn't a way to have a gap where you don't actually have a class throughout the day. But another way to look at it is you, you could have a gap in terms of it being a BBS class or a dual enrollment class and have a class on campus and, and use that BBS or dual enrollment class as your gap. The other answer to your question is, is absolutely, if you have only one class that's actually in person on campus, you are able to come to that class and then leave, just so long as you are also still scheduled for three other classes, somehow, some way in the rest of your day. But um, yeah, absolutely, this, this format provides you with the, uh, the flexibility to be able to do that. You would come through the front office and leave through the front office just for the sake of uh, traffic patterns, but yes, absolutely, we can accommodate that. Okay, thank you. No problem. Ms. Lindhorst, if you'd like to ask your question. Yes, thank you. Um, I was curious about class size and has the max class size changed for uh, from be prior to the health crisis or is it the same? The class size perhaps remain in place. Um, that's a state uh, amendment, constitutional amendment, so it can only be changed. Back, um, well, really, the citizens of Florida, and uh, the you know, so all the classes that are subject to the class size cap are still subject to the class size cap, and that, it, that includes kids who are sitting in front of us and the kids who are accessing through e-learning. So. Again, I say the class is subject to class size cap because some of our electives are not um, subject to the class size cap. So they will go over 25 students. And every once in a while, you'll have a class over 25, but it has to be matched up you know, somewhere in the schedule with a class of less than 25. But um, I've worked in, in districts all over the country, and you know we don't have near the class sizes, the large class sizes of other class size cap is still in place. Thank you so much. All right, any other questions? Okay, Jay, I see you have your hand raised. If you'd like to go ahead and unmute your mic and ask your question, Jay. 
Yeah, just a quick question. Are all high schools in Bavard County going on the four classroom type of schedule? So if anybody moves, if we move into a different district, it's just easy or move to a different school zone. It's easy to go back and forth. Yeah, great question. Yes, the district um, has moved all middle and high schools to the four by four block for this year. I don't know what will happen in 21-22, but for this year, we're all on the four by four block for the entire year. Okay, thank you very much. All right, I have no hands raised. If anyone wants to raise a hand or ask a question, go right ahead. Any questions? Anyone have any questions? Okay, I have one question. Um, will breakfast still be offered for the students in the morning? Yes, um, breakfast and lunch um, are all going to be a grab and go type of deal, the, um, six feet apart, and all the stuff will be prepackaged. So they'll go through the line, and it'll all be grab and go. Um, so. Um, you know, I actually think that the the lunch situation is going to be the best we've ever had it with going to three lunches um, and increasing our outside seating. And we're not going to keep a grade level or anything in the cafeteria or anything like that. So it's going to be it's going to be great. But yeah, breakfast still happening, um, still available. It's just going to be kind of a grab and go type format. All right, if anyone has a question, go ahead and either raise a hand or chime in. Um, hi, I have another question. Sure, go right ahead. If we're doing e-learning, do we have a specific plan for PE? Yeah, so we talked about that a few minutes ago. Um, PE is going to be a little bit different in that not every period, but every, you know, whenever PE teacher is going to take the class necessarily outside and do an activity in the field, um, the student who's accessing that PE class through e-learning will not necessarily be able to travel with the class to experience that because the teacher's not um, the laptop with them out there to the field and that kind of thing. So they'll be given an alternative assignment complete on their own. Um, so PE is going to look a little different than some of the other, well, all the other classes in that there will be time where you'll be doing your activity on your own. Any other questions? I have a question. Sure, go ahead. Sorry, um, I missed the first hour, so I apologize if I ask a question that's already been addressed. Um, with kids attending in person, um, what's the mask policy details on that? And then if things were to, if we got uncomfortable and decided to keep them for e-learning instead, just is that pretty easy to make that change? Yeah, so good, good question. Um, so uh, last Thursday, we originally had this meeting scheduled for last Thursday evening, but we, the board, the school board uh, was meeting that evening and they were considering some changes. So we wanted to reschedule this meeting. One of the things they were considering was different language to the mask policy. So the way the mask policy had read up until last week was at first masks are um, strongly encouraged and then wearing of masks was uh, expected. And then Thursday, the school board decided to make masks required. So all of the people on campus, students and staff alike, are required to wear a face mask anytime they can't safely social distance. 
which pretty much is almost the whole time we're here on campus. So um, we do need to um, have everybody wear their masks. Uh, we have uh, disposable, you know, um, paper masks that we can issue to a student if they don't have a mask when they come. Um, and we have thousands of them, so we should have plenty for the year or however long we have to do this. And uh, it's going to be treated kind of like a dress code violation. If they don't have the mask, then we can correct it. Or if they're not wearing their mask, they can correct it and move on. If they re refuse, then we you know, as, as a dress code violation, call mom or dad and that kind of thing. Uh, your second question, if if they're here in person and they decide they want to go to e-learning, um, you can do that at any time throughout the semester. Um, it really just is notifying us that, hey, you know, we've been in person for these classes for all day and we'd like to go to e-learning. Um, and we just, you know, flip you over in the computer, so to speak, doing that. Still in the same classes, same teachers, you're just going to access it now um, through the e-learning format. Uh, we don't really want it to be a, a back and forth where this week I want to be in person, next week I want to be e-learning. It needs to be kind of, it, we want the kids to get into a flow and a rhythm like this is how they're going to do it. And then if at any time it's not successful, they're not comfortable, they can switch. We just don't want it to be like every other day or every other week. So we're kind of trying to say maybe once a quarter um, you know, if you want to make the switch. But it, start out one format it's not working you want to switch to the other format it's totally fine so if i can ask a follow-up question on that with the mask policy and lunches i mean you know are masks are going to be required only in classrooms or just during transit i'm, I'm kind of curious a little bit about that um or is they expected to be wearing it um just all day so the way the policy reads is when social distancing when social distancing is not uh, available or able to happen. I can't think of the exact terminology, but obviously when they're sitting down to eat and, and at, during lunch, you know, they need to take their masks off and do all that. One of the things that I'm encouraged about is the fact that we have a lot of outdoor seating. So, you know, during lunch, we, a lot of our kids are going to choose to eat outside. So, you know, they'll be a little more relaxed there when they're sitting there, you know, outside. But um, the rule reads anytime, you know, they, they can't safely practice social distancing, they should be wearing the mask. Now, obviously, you know, the rule is out in our community about when you're eating and if you're at a restaurant and it's outside, um, you know, that's going to, those are exceptions. Thank you. Really appreciate everything you guys are doing. Mr. Ron, are you there? Oops, I'm sorry. I had my my mute, my mic was muted. Uh, I had a Jeanette that had her hand raised, uh, but it seems that maybe the hand went down while I was talking. I apologize. Does anyone have a? Go ahead. I'm here. Um, I was wondering. I asked Miss Carr about this, and she said she wasn't sure. But I was wondering if anyone of you guys knew about what you're doing about the senior parking spots, like what I can do to get one, and like when does that process start? Yep, so um, next Tuesday afternoon, during the junior senior register, um, the very last stop will be when you pick up your schedule, and then after that is the optional parking spot station. So our new SRO, Officer Kosicki, will be there and you'll be able to purchase your parking space Monday afternoon, excuse me, Tuesday afternoon during registration. Yes. Okay, thank you for clearing that up. Okay, Mary Ann, if you'd like to unmute your uh, mic and go ahead and ask your question. Yes, um, the, the weatherman has indicated lots of hurricanes for this particular season. And um, if the school has to close during hurricane time, would all of the in-school classes immediately for that length of time convert to e-learning so that the uh, education could continue? 
It's a very good question. Um, more than likely, the, the classes would stop entirely. Um, whenever we've been closed for hurricanes before, we we are closed um, because you know we don't know that people remain in their homes. We don't you know they evacuate, they go to shelters. Uh, we don't necessarily have reliable power and internet and stuff like that. If for some reason we were going to be out an extended period of time, I think the district would explore you know operating through an e-learning format or a virtual format, but if we're going to shut down for a day or two um, on one side of a hurricane in even three days. I doubt we would switch entirely to e-learning. I think we would just take a pause. Okay, but losing even two days with a 90-minute class, you're losing a lot of material. So how would that material be right. made? So any Right. So anytime we've closed school in the past for hurricanes, we either add makeup days um, to make up the time for that. If, if it's not, so we need to be late. No one's going to miss the instruction because we're not going to be delivering the instruction. Um, you know, so it's either going to be added on in the form of more makeup days or um, if we have enough minutes, so to speak, in the schedule, then it, it won't be made up. But no one's going to miss the instruction and that we haven't delivered it, so it doesn't have to be made up, so to speak. Okay, thank you. All right, any questions? We are getting down to the final 10 minutes of this uh, scheduled uh, virtual Skype call. Uh, we're here for you, so if you have questions, please don't hesitate to speak up and ask. Um, but as we get to the end of the night, we might just be running out of questions. That's fine, too. I, ha I have one more if no one has their hands up. Sure, go right ahead. So for next week, then, it's in-person registration. Is that just for the kids going in face-to-face, -face, or is that everybody? So the registration experience for next week is for everybody, everybody. Um, and it's a drive-through experience. So even the students who are participating in e-learning should come through because that's when they're going to get their schedule. We're going to check and make sure we have all the proper documentation. Um, we're going to do, do the $5 activity fee. You're going to be able to buy a parking space and things like that. Because even if you're e-learning, if you're a junior or a senior, you might want to get that parking space because at some point we hope you're going to be coming to school. But um, yeah, it's for every student um, to come through um, the registration experience next week. And everyone is also still uh, required to have a registration packet. So regardless of what uh, option you might be choosing unless you are withdrawing from us completely, we still need you to have a registration packet and all the associated paperwork on file. What should, we, what should we do to make sure that you do have it on file? I think we did all that well, way back when. You're, yeah, you're more than welcome to call the front office and uh, ask for Miss um, Davis, Brooke Davis. She'll be able to tell you real quick whether or not she has it and if everything's complete. Um, we're, we're, we are also trying to, to call, you know, as many people as we possibly can, but, you know, it's, it's, it is difficult to try to call everyone and get everyone to remind them that they, uh, you know, they're missing a packet. But by all means, if you call, we would be able to tell you that we have it and that you're set and ready to go. Good question. Anybody else? Questions? Don't be afraid. If you have a question, please speak up. We're here to, to answer your questions.
I have a quick question um, with regard to cleaning protocols. Um, have those been stepped up now within the school for um, like daily cleaning of the classrooms, et cetera? Yeah, so uh, additional cleaning materials have um, changed the rotation of the custodians so that they can be cleaning more during the time. Um, so the classrooms will be deep cleaned at the end of every, every day. The restrooms are going to be cleaned in between every during each period. Um, the cafeteria is going to be cleaned after each, you know, before lunch, but obviously between each lunch. And that's another beauty. Three lunch period schedule that we have. Three lunches will lunch break before the next lunch. We'll be able to totally clean the cafeteria tables, the serving areas, and that kind of thing. Um, the restroom is going to have a gallon of um, hand sanitizer, a tub right near the door um, as the students walk in. Uh, there are to be some other cleaning materials available to the teachers that they can use in be between class. Uh, you know, so yeah, we've totally rearranged schedules and done as a uh, deep cleaning machine that will run through every classroom at, at uh, at the um, overnight, um, so that it's you know it's a spray chemical and it cleans the classroom entirely, and that's going to happen every night um, in every classroom. Thank Mr. you, Mr. Ryan. Nope, nope. I, I think you covered it. I do have one more question. This is Mary Ann. Yes, ma'am, go ahead. Thank you. If a child is doing a Brevard virtual class, let's say a history class, and is not happy with it, could they then transfer to the e-learning mode of that class? Um, not once, once they begin that Brevard virtual class. Um, during the semester, you know, that's a semester commitment. Um, there might be a drop period. I'm not, you know, Mr. Ryan may be more familiar with that, but, you know, that's the, I'd say the risk you take by enrolling in a Brevard virtual or Florida virtual class, but you're taking a semester, Ryan. Yeah, so let's just say you're talking about a student that is withdrawn from us and gone to full time Florida virtual or BVS. That is a semester commitment, like Dr. Rindell said, and there, you know, is you're, you're kind of stuck there, so to speak, until the end of that semester where you can make a change. Um, if if you're in a situation where you're doing some sort of blended model and you've signed up for a BVS course uh, alongside a, an e-learning and possibly even an in-person brick and mortar, you are still taking that same or making that same one semester commitment for that one BVS class. Anything that is done on the BVS or FLVS platform is a one semester commitment, regardless of whether you've withdrawn and gone there or you're doing it as part of a blended model. Thank you. No problem. That's a good question. Anyone with any final questions as we dwindle down the last few minutes of our session? Well, Dr. Rendell, with three minutes left, I don't know if you have any final comments. Uh, we're kind of slowing up on the questions. Do you have any final yeah, comments? Just, again, I want to thank everybody for taking the time to be with us tonight. Hopefully, we've shared some good information. If you have any questions, you can always email us or call us. Um, you, can, you can access my email through the website. Um, you can call here and ask for me and that kind of thing. You know, we, uh, we've done some, I think, some really good things to get ready for this year, but there's a, cur a new curveball every day, you know, a new a hurdle to overcome every day. Um, but uh, know that we're doing you know, everything we can to provide a safe and um, strong academic environment for all of our, all of our students. Um, this format, this um, Q&A format is something we're probably going to continue throughout the year, um, maybe once a month or, you know, some time frame and 
we may call it something different, office hours or something, and there may be a topic that we're going to address and then do Q&A after or something like that. But we feel like this has been a great way for us to get information out to you. But more importantly for us, we're learning what your questions are, what your questions and concerns are so that we can respond to those. And there were some good questions tonight that'll cause us to go back and look at, make sure we're doing things the right way. So appreciate everybody's time tonight. If you have any more questions, let us know. Thank you everyone. And this recording will be up on our YouTube channel uh, tomorrow morning. So you, if, you, if you have anything that you wanna replay and rewatch or you wanna let a friend know that didn't get to make it, it'll be on the YouTube channel tomorrow morning. Thank you. And if, if you go to the website, you can see the links to the previous YouTube, to these previous meetings and that to the YouTube channel. That's how you can get. Thank you.